start with Dr. Travis Edmiston, who uh, will be talking about the acute rehabilitative effort and interventions, uh, ICU and the transition to the inpatient acute rehabilitation. I am proud to introduce Dr. Edmiston as my colleague. He's an assistant professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation at Johns Hopkins. Uh, School of Medicine. He did his undergraduate at uh, Oregon State, and he got his MD degree at Oregon Health and Sciences University in Portland. And as I mentioned, he's right now uh, uh, in Baltimore, uh, although I do believe that he is giving this talk uh, from uh, offsite. So Travis, uh, thank you for joining us. All right, thanks uh, for having me. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pardo and Dr. Sadowski. Here, I'll share my screen. So today I'm gonna be talking about uh, rehab's role in ICU. And when it comes to inpatient uh, rehabilitation and consults, I could talk for hours, but uh, in the spirit of uh, keeping us on track, I'll, I'll move on. First, I have no disclosures. Um, just to kind of hit takeaway points uh, early on, really the, the goal of all the teams uh, and particularly our mindset is, is focused on getting families and children back to their community and back to home as healthy and as uh, soon as possible. Uh, in the rehab, uh, in the ICU setting, the rehab team's role really is supporting the ICU teams, the consulting teams, you know, adding whatever expertise we can along the way and trying to break down barriers that might prevent that child from making it over to the uh, rehab unit as, as quickly as possible. And uh, the last takeaway really, it's never too early to bring us in. Um, it's shown to be beneficial to all populations and reduce lengths of stay. And uh, we are good at being a collaborative team and we're always ready to help out. So first I wanted to talk a little bit about like the old, kind of antiquated, it still stick around, sticks around model of uh, acute medical and rehab versus the more modern model. Uh, above, you, I've tried to depict kind of what the traditional model has been. There's an acute injury. There's a lot of acute medical need, ICU, surgical, you know, whatever that happens to be, and then that kind of quiets down. And then there's a consult to rehab. And then from zero to uh, you know 100 miles an hour, we're trying to work from that point to get people home. The more modern model now is to bring the rehab team um, and whatever uh, expertise they may have in early as possible, and then we will, uh, you know, take on more, more, more of a role over time. Makes that transition to rehab easier. The goal here is to uh, reduce the medical length of stay and get people home quicker. Um, and luckily, you know, we've we've had a lot of uh, research by Dr. Dale Needham's team in the ICU and showing that uh, contrary to what a lot of ICU providers feel, um, it is very safe, it reduces length of stay, and it reduces uh, weakness that, that happens while in the ICU. So, you know, supporting the ICU teams and the consulting teams and really start that assessment and planning, moving towards a rehab unit as soon as possible. Specific to AFM and uh, ICU, and the rehab team's role, you know, here, I, you know, I've had the unique opportunity, which is not, I know is not unique to us, but relatively unique that, you know, we're brought in very, very early on, uh, oftentimes before, you know, that child, uh, you know, has hit their the neurologic uh, low point that they have. So, uh, you know, and we do this because we have close communication between all the teams, the ICU, the neurology team, infectious disease, and uh, the PMNR team. So even from the initial AFM suspicion, and that allows us to be a part of the diagnosis and prognosis discussions that are going on, um, you know, uh, both with the teams and with the families. And then also uh, being connected with those teams to talk about, you know, what happens in post-acute course, you know, what's, you know, in rehab and, and what uh, goals we're gonna have and, and uh, longer term as well, which we'll talk about more today. Also, you know, being involved early on gives me I mean, this is really my perspective here. It gives me a, a better feeling of what the functional strength changes have happened, what's going on, what's the pattern of weakness that, that's developed and developing, where was the lowest you know, level of function, and then where is that turnaround point, and where do we start to see early recovery 
And what's the pattern of that? We kind of know that, that recovery follows a reverse pattern. So having a hands-on uh, experience of that instead of you know, looking through, through notes is, is helpful in rehab planning down the road. So in those first couple of days, what are we doing? My, my personal goal in those first days is really to make contact with the medical team. What I wanna do is uh, you know, make sure we open those lines of communication and we maintain those, share with them how we can support them as, as that individual goes through their ICU course and then really start as early as possible that, that discussion about uh, moving to a rehab unit. If we know somebody has weakness and we know they're gonna have weakness afterwards, you know, starting planning for that early on, it takes time um, and getting that ball rolling. As families, you know, we know that we're gonna be part of these families' lives for the first few days, weeks, months, and years down the road. So making that introduction and getting them familiar with who we are and, and how we can support them is important. Uh, you know, that also allows us to share roles that we're gonna have throughout their different uh, phases of, of, of recovery. Um, and all of this, the goal that I have with these initial discussions with the families is to provide a roadmap for, for recovery. We know that they are probably having their most stressful, scary event of that family's life at that moment when I'm meeting them. And you know, everyone's talking about ventilators and infusions and you know, paralysis and MRIs. And through these conversations, we're able to talk to them about, okay, this stuff is going to calm down. And when it does, there is, there is a plan for afterwards and we're gonna be part of that plan. And the goal there is to give them hope. After this first couple of days, and I'll go through each one of these in the next slides, but you know, really it is just continuation and adaptation to the needs of the, of the team at that point and making sure that, that we've reduced barriers for transition to uh, a rehab unit. So supporting the ICU teams, one thing that, that we've seen a lot of is autonomic dysfunction and how this presents and how this may be interpreted by those initial ICU teams is different than how I might approach it. I'm not there to help you know, dictate how they're gonna care for the patient. They know that better than, than anybody and how to keep them safe. But I'll show examples of how temperature, heart rate and blood pressure dysregulation can pop up, how that may look to a rehab team um, during transition and how I'm able to reduce those barriers and make sure that they're not a barrier once once we get to that stage. Um, respiratory function is, and talking about that early on is important. So, you know, if there's, if there's impact of the diaphragm, we're looking at uh, working with the pulmonology team, the ICU team and the neurology team to see what that function is uh, and see if it's, you know, partially affected or fully affected through an ultrasound EMG tests uh, that, the, that the neurology team is gonna be doing. Um, and then again, we're thinking long term. How do we minimize and uh, you know minimize the, the diaphragm's atrophy, whether that's you know vent weeding in the ICU or we're talking down the road. Um, if is there a role and what that might be with the di diaphragm pacer, and just starting and it kind of instigating some of those conversations. And a big thing is ventilators on rehab units is often a barrier to discharge to a rehab unit. And it's the same with a pediatric rehab unit. So if we know that there's gonna be a ventilator that's gonna to need to go with that child, planning for the right uh, institution and the right place for them to go is gonna be important. You need to do that early on because it's a huge barrier. So kind of going back to temperature, you know, the numbers are less important here than, than really noticing that this is over the first couple of weeks. And you can see the, the large variation in temperature regulation early on. Um, you know, if we're talking with the ICU team and they're familiar and they know that this is, you know, a possible thing that the, that the child may experience, this maybe, you know, prevents one or maybe two, uh, you know, big infectious disease workups that the child would go through. I mean, some of these spikes are multiple times a day. So, you know, really it's, it's, you know, working with them to uh, manage, uh, you know, that acute course. You know, we looked at, uh, you know, heart rate instability. Again, this is over, you know, two or three weeks. You can see a lot of instability in that first week or two. Yeah, it's, there's even uh, 
uh, common to have arrhythmias, or at least we've, we've seen arrhythmias. And that kind of settles into, for some folks, into this tachycardia. So when a rehab team is looking at this saying, okay, when is this child ready for transition to a rehab unit? Their heart rate, you know, being sustained in the 170s without context of what they're going through um, and what this is going to look like two weeks or three weeks down the road could be a barrier to discharge and delay by days or weeks, and we don't want to do that. And very similar to the heart rate is blood pressure. Um, you know, this rise in blood pressure, you know, some, some uh, kids that we've worked with have had quite high blood pressure early on. And so how do we start seeing this and addressing it as it's happening or before it happens uh, so we can be proactive on, on planning uh, for, for that discharge uh, over to a rehab unit. And we can't have a rehab talk without talking about bowel and bladder. You know, it wasn't that long ago, 2014, you know, some of the, the publications out there at that time were saying that, you know, bowel and bladder was not involved. For a lot of folks, it is involved. So it's just something to think about when we're having those conversations. The MRI um, is an, an acute admission MRI of a, of, uh, of a child with AFM, and you can see that there's significant bladder distension. So just having those conversations and talking about that and working towards uh, management. Um, another thing is, is pain. We're not unfamiliar with managing pain, uh, specifically you know, related to neurologic injury. And a lot of uh, folks early on may have some neuropathic pain, which can you know, trigger some uh, autonomic dysfunction. So you know, having that conversation, bringing that up, talking about so, I mean, there management. Is a problem with the audio, so just check and see if your audio is okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so having discussions about pain and the sources of those early on um, is just a, a way of reducing suffering and hopefully reducing any kind of uh, autonomic reaction to those. So therapy's role, we know that, that some uh, you know, individuals with AFM will have um, you know, neck involvement, bulbar involvement, and swallowing dysfunction. So getting speech uh, language pathologists involved early on is important. And we kind of know their role um, and we want to progress and identify those issues as early as possible. And also communication support. So, you know, if, if the child is, is, is too weak to speak or they're on a ventilator, how are they, you know, able to communicate with the family and with, with the people around them? So talking about that early on as well. From a physical and occupational therapy perspective, um, we'll talk about muscle atrophy on the next slide, but we're you know, those teams are, are working to maintain range of motion, prevent any kind of uh, stiffness or loss of range of motion. Um, and then also the input that they have on level of function, which could be rapidly changing throughout that week or two weeks of ICU course is uh, that they've got a handle of that. So whereas a neurologic exam may say, hey, this, this bicep went from a four to a three, that gives us one piece of information. But if a therapist is saying, Hey, yesterday the child was able to feed themselves and today they're not. That's another piece of information. And so it's, it's, it's related, but it's more functional and gives us a better idea of, of at least from my perspective on, on what's happening functionally with the, with the individual. And then coordinating as much as we can uh, with doing as much as we can from a functional perspective within you know, safety parameters within the ICU. And then we also, of course, need our, our, our therapists to you know, assist us with recommendations for acute rehab to go through that administrative portion of those referrals. So going back to muscle atrophy, really the big, big thing we're looking at is the less strength we've lost during that ICU or acute medical stay, the less strength we have to work to regain. And so with the uninvolved muscles, that's a little more straightforward, right? Uh, we're trying to reduce uh, the loss due to misuse, and we're using functional activities uh, to try to do that. But the involved muscles is is a little more complicated, right? We know that that uh, so some lower motor neuron activity is going to be affected. We also have partially affected areas, and we want to support that end organ, that muscle, as much as possible. So during the recovery, 
of that lower motor neuron to that area um, as if we can keep that muscle as healthy as possible um, in that first you know couple weeks and then that hopefully the goal is to have that uh, muscle be stronger um, and more receptive to functional activities down the road um, we do that through a lot of a lot of times through electrical stimulation as there may not be good uh, volitional activity if, if a child is is sedated um, um, but also helping with uh, you know functional electrical stimulation and uh, just stimulating those muscles we've also noticed that uh, sometimes even if there's not full volitional activity that we can observe we can see that the reflex arc is actually still intact because they're they're having a little bit of of response to to that electrical stimulation. Um, and you know this is about transfer for planning, but this is almost kind of mute at this point because this is again what we've been talking about the whole time. So we want to want to support and head off any kind of barriers to that transition process. So that starts with early planning and getting case management involved and deciding on what's the best ins institution to send that referral to and speaking with them about that. What are the barriers that are in place? How can we be proactive about them and reduce them so they're not a delay in days or weeks to, to discharge? Um, and a big part of that is looking at stability. That's what rehab units are looking at. You know, if they're, you know, are there st stable vital signs or is there a plan in the context of that person's individual um, AFM experience? The respiratory status as we talked about with the ventilators and the need for IV medications and, and transitioning those over whenever possible. Um, and then the last kind of role in ICU uh, that a rehab team has is making sure that that transition happens with a warm handoff and that we play as, as much of a continuity role as we can, you know, bridging those different units, but, but very often we're talking about completely different hospitals. So how do you make that process go smooth? Um, and, and by contacting both teams and making sure that, that that transition happens well. And that kind of leads into, you know, what we do at, you know, at the hospital level, at the acute rehab unit. Um, final thoughts really is kind of going back to that first thing is that the goal of all of us, all of our teams is getting them back to home and community as soon as possible. And that's really the focus of the ICU team, neurology team and the rehab team and everyone else involved. So I want to say thank you to everybody, all the different specialty teams, uh, all the, the teams at Kennedy Krieger, um, uh, this symposium, and obviously all, all the research teams everywhere, and also to the families for letting us be a part of their care. Questions, discussion? Okay, so uh, can I ask Dr. Edmiston, you mentioned um, this autonomia. Is that mostly observed in the children with more with both upper and lower limbs involvement, and specifically with bulbar involvement, or does it occur in children with the monoplegia or uh, lower limbs involvement too? Well, that's a that's a good question. Um, the ones that we've seen. Uh, with pretty substantial dysautonomia have been the ones where the extensive you know, cervical cord has been involved, uh, the interior horn cells there, and then into, and a lot of these kids, you know, we've seen into the brainstem, so with the bulbar involvement as well. So um, the good thing is, is we don't have a, you know, a thousands data set, you know, of, of these cases, but but you're right. Yeah, the ones, the more severity of, of involvement in the, in uh, all form involvement, we tend to see a little bit more of this, and more extensive where it's bleeding into the the first weeks of rehab, and can be a medical issue that, that we need to address. And another question uh, from me. <laughs> well, uh, well, let's see. That uh, <laughs> we have a question in the Q and A, and then I'll I'll come back. How to find a patient for abdominal breathing techniques? Uh, okay, let's see if I understand that. Um, how, I guess that the question would be um, how to train a patient for abdominal breathing technique. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that's that's a that's a good question. Um, you know, that looking at, at ventilator weaning and different strategies for that in the acute rehab setting, obviously that's a big big part of uh, you know what we're trying to do with kids that are ventilator dependent or you know need some sort of pressure support. So I think that would be part of you know working with uh, pulmonologists and and respiratory therapists and seeing and slowly if we can go you know minutes and then longer and just like any other kind of sprinting um, strategy. But that's a good question. I don't have a, a slam dunk answer for that. Maybe Dr. Shinivasan can can uh, jump in. I know that I'm springing this on on you. Do you have any techniques to 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 strengthen to train a, a child for abdominal breathing? Um, I mean, I guess abdominal breathing, teaching abdominal breathing in adults itself is um, a little challenging, I suppose, but. In children, um, I personally don't have any experience treat, uh, teaching them how to do that. Um, so I'm going to defer on that. Okay, well, Sorry. people that do not have uh, an academic institution, rehab provide, PMNR provider, what would you want those uh, individuals to know about or ask about? Three? take home point? Well, for me, it would be getting whatever rehab resources you have involved as early as possible. That's number one. Number two, um, making those referrals to a rehab unit that's going to meet, meet the needs of that individual or child as early as possible. And for rehab professionals in that field it is you know don't be afraid to get into the icu don't be afraid to share your expertise because you're going to have a slightly different perspective than the rest of the teams and it is valuable um, you're not going to be talking about adjusting vent settings usually <laughs> within the first week but but the your experience is is uh valuable and uh we know that getting teams involved reduces length of stay and hopefully um, reduces uh, length of stay required in the rehab setting as well. Okay, well, thank you very much. So I guess uh, rehab matters. Without a doubt. <laughs>